Welcome to the Reviews Without Remorse podcast with Joe and Dave. Be warned, the discussions in this podcast may contain detailed spoilers. For spoiler-free reviews, be sure to check out our show on YouTube. Enter at your own risk and enjoy the show. Discover what makes her a hero on Reviews Without Remorse. This is episode number 108. In this episode, we lost Jan Michael Vincent. David and I will pay tribute. And then we go higher, further, faster. As Dave and I discuss the newest in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the much anticipated Captain Marvel. What's up, partner? Hey, my man. I'm looking forward to discussing this. A little, little nervous, but we'll, we'll talk more about it in a minute. <laughs> yeah, very true, very true. And it's going to be, uh, the news is very tight this week, which is good because, boy, we've got a lot to talk about with this movie. I- indeed, indeed. Oh. I hope we can cover it all. We can. Let's get to it. My life's worth more than a piece of film. I'll tell you exactly what your life is worth. Your life is worth $50,000. That's the price you put on it when you got behind this wheel. Sonny, Ski, if you do not try to make this jump, you'll never work in this town again. Is that... We're going, huh? We're going, yeah, we're going. You're crazy. I'm going to hit it. Born July 15th, 1945 in Denver, Colorado, with 84 film and television credits to his name, Jan Michael Vincent was for a little while there the kind of it boy, and then just faded away. He started off uh, in Dragnet, uh, the Banana Splits Adventure Hour. Do you remember the Banana Splits? La, 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 uh, la, la, Vaguely, la. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bonanza. The Survivors, uh, he was in Going Home, The Mechanic, probably the first one that he would uh, be recognized for, with um, with Burt Reynolds, I believe, and uh, Baby Blue Marine, which was actually a movie that used to play on HBO a lot because it was a PG movie back in the uh, back in the eighties. Do you remember that one? The the guy who washed out of the Marines and and took the uniform of a of a Marine hero who who died. I, I do not. Oh no, that was a good one. That was, that was a pretty good one. Uh, Damnation Alley, Defiance, but probably the one that you and I best remember him from. Don't say it. Has to be the it. 1978 Hooper. Oh, that I thought you were going to say something else. <laughs> what, what did you think I was going to say? Well, yeah, Hooper is that is definitely the one that I remember very specifically. Uh, he was he was great in that. Uh, the one I was thinking of that as as a child I watched over and over and over the world's greatest athlete <laughs> do you remember this movie i do not remember that movie <laughs> he this was it was sort of this was a, a a very lesser known disney movie a live action movie and the gist of it was it was almost oh my, he's a tarzan type yes wasn't he? right it, yes okay it was almost like <laughs> the jungle book in his early 20s you know he, yeah, they, they sort of pluck him. He, you're right. He's like a Tarzan, basically, and they sort of discover him as, as you know, because he's out running the cheetahs and crazy stuff like that. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I must have seen that, I don't know how many times when I was younger. <laughs> oh, my God. I do remember that. That's freaking funny as Not hell. as fast as Nanu. What's Nanu? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was a surfer. He was a good-looking guy. He's biggest claim to fame with the rest of the world probably would have to be the TV series Airwolf. Yep. Absolutely. That was definitely that was definitely the one that he was best basically known for. Um, he worked relatively steadily right up until 2002 and then he just dropped off of the face of the planet because he'd gotten into a car accident and kind of lost his voice and then eventually lost his freaking leg. Yeah. Um, he, he used... I mean, there were some bad times for this guy. He was, um, in his personal life, was not all that good, and it probably cost him his career, which is kind of a shame because he was actually a pretty solid 
um, character actor and a decent leading man. Uh, he died on February the 10th in Asheville, North Carolina at the age of 74. 73, excuse me. Mm. He, he, I mean, that's that's not as young as I would have guessed because he, like, like you said, he did have a very rough go of things for a while there. He was... He kind of had one of those Mickey Rourke transformations where he was honestly kind of unrecognizable later in his career. Yeah, but my, my Mickey Rourke at least kept it together enough to keep his career going. True, you know? <laughs> right, right. He he did have a resurgence, whereas Jan Michael Vincent, not as much. But uh, yeah, and, and it was a shame because he he was a, a talent and he was a good looking guy. Yep. And by the well, way, uh, Mary, you said I never point out good looking guys in in the podcast. Jan Michael Vincent was a good looking guy. <laughs> Guy, guy was a phenomenally good looking. Yeah, there you go. You know? But, uh, yes, uh, farewell, Jan Michael Vincent. This quadrant of Earth is not as good without you, sir. Well said. So, scrolls are the bad guys. And you're a Kree, a race of noble warriors. Heroes. Noble warrior heroes. Carol Danvers becomes one of the universe's most powerful heroes when Earth is caught in the middle of a galactic war between two alien races. Written by Anne Bowden, Ryan Fleck, and Geneva Robertson Dwart, based on a story written by Nicole Perlman, Meg LaFleu, Anne Bowden, Ryan Fleck, and Geneva Robertson Duart, directed by Anne Bowden and Ryan Fleck, Marvel's Captain Marvel, which sounds kind of redundant when I put it that way, but okay. <laughs> that was a mouthful, boy. There was a lot of hands in this soup, wasn't it? Yeah, a lot of names I could barely pronounce, so I apologize, ladies and gentlemen, for completely butchering your names, but there it is. Uh, here's a question. You usually say based on characters created by. Yeah, I didn't. I couldn't find that in time. It wasn't in the movie, and I couldn't find the credits for that. Okay, gotcha. So, what you really are. So, Joe. Um, see, I kind of feel like I'm going to start with you on this one because I've been kind of feeling a little bit of tension, shall we say, with regards to the movie with you, and I and I'm kind of wanting to feel how you're feeling about this movie, Joe. What is your initial impressions about this movie? Uh, well, I before I get into my initial impressions, I will say, yeah, tensions were. I I was a little on edge, and and honestly, it's because this this film, leading up to its release, and I don't think I've ever seen a Marvel movie with so much controversy. And you know, um, is it warranted? Is it fair that that, it, that it's been so controversial? Well, I guess that depends on your personal point of view. Uh, there, there was a part of me that was very tempted to say, Brie Larson, uh, out of respect for you, as an old white guy, I will not review your movie. Uh, jokingly. But, uh, so, it was there. I mean, that, that, that kind of, is this going to be the first woke Marvel movie, was, was really there, and, and a lot of people were very nervous that they, many a franchise has been ruined by not so much the agenda, but just what people think they need to do to service the agenda, which I sort of feel like is very self-defeating. And if, and if that, maybe my understanding of it is very different. So this idea that you need to marry sue your characters, uh, because of a fearfulness to show weakness in your female characters, I find to be just completely wrong. Hmm. That's not how you develop a character. And that's not how you show strength and heroism by just, putting no obstacles in front of them. Uh, okay, so that was my fear going in. Is this going to be one of those kinds of a deal? Um, I'm happy to say that I did not feel that way at all. I felt that they did treat this character well, that this is a character you should bring your children to, that you should bring your daughters to see. Uh, it was not a character without obstacles. So, yeah, my initial impression of the film is that it was great. Uh I tried to stay pretty. I tried to stay completely spoiler free, and I tried to avoid reviews going in. Um, I did get a sense that there was some lukewarmness around this film, um, and I wasn't getting that. I was very 
happy with it. I thought it was terrific. I, 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 I think that a lot of people are going to compare it to Wonder Woman as being the first female Marvel film. Uh, and I think Wonder Woman might have might have it over this film in certain respects. But for the most part, I thought this was a dynamite film. I was very happy with it. And it's still very fresh, by the way. Mm -hmm. So all of this, this is, this is, I mean, I'm, when I say fresh, I mean like a half an hour ago fresh. Like I literally <laughs> just left the theater, came home and set up. Uh, so yeah, it, it's a, still, still very fresh. But again, my, my initial feeling was that it was a solid Marvel film. Uh, they have come through yet again. Uh, my girlfriend felt the same way. And I kind of felt like she was, again, if you want to talk about the target audience, she was certainly the target audience. She was happy with it. The soundtrack was great. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, as a child of the nineties, I loved every bit of the soundtrack. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm pleased. I am very pleased. And it, it's, it is, a, it is a different kind of a character, I think. So it'll, it'll be, and we'll get into the subtleties of that. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out in terms of the greater Marvel universe. And of course, with Avengers Endgame. So yeah, color me impressed and, and pleased. Um, my friend, and incidentally, I, I, I won't jump right into picking your brain about whether or not this was faithful to the character in the comics, but your initial thoughts, my friend. First of all, in Marvel, we trust. You forgot there that, you sir. You forgot that. I, I, I didn't forget it, but with <laughs> every film, I do kind of knock on wood on the way in and say, "Keep go let's keep going, guys. Let's keep going, but go ahead. Um, this was a wonderful movie. I enjoyed it immensely. I did kind of walk in kind of with my fingers crossed. Um, the story of Carol Danvers is an extremely long and complicated one. She has an amazingly rich and rather dark backstory. Uh, and in fact, there is an aspect of her story that they couldn't even do due to the fact that mutants are owned by Fox, whereas Marvel only recently got involved with the mutants. But we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Uh, the bottom line is, was it entertaining? Did the characterization of Carol Danvers make sense? Did the side plots work? Yes. Yes, they did. I felt like this movie was even better than I anticipated, and I kind of had high hopes for it, to be honest with you. Um, I thought the character of Carol was well cast, was well acted. I thought that um, Samuel L. Jackson was just on point throughout like most of the movie. He's easily, easily my favorite parts of the movie. And holy moly, dude, was that not amazing de-aging effects on him or what? Yes, to the point that I honestly, I, I if somebody said, no, no, they just uh, shot him with a little Botox and, and uh, sent him on his way, I would have been like, okay. Because, yeah, I did, I, the de-aging, de de I didn't even notice at all. Yeah. Uh, the visual effects were good. The fights were great. Um it's leading into uh, Avengers Endgame. I felt worked. There is not a there is a lot to like. There's a you know one or two things like not completely solid about it, but a solid solid outing, especially especially for a character that outside of the comic world nobody really knows about. So I felt it was a proper introduction, a good story. I liked a lot of the twists that they did. Uh, unlike some people, I don't understand why people have a problem with it, but I kind of liked it. I liked that it it didn't it didn't go out. It didn't actually like sit there and say to itself, "We're here to subvert expectations." No, it just did. It just did it, and it did it in a logical way. We're gonna get to that when we get to the spoilers aspect of things, but um, I liked it a lot, and I'm very happy. I'm very satisfied with it, and there's not really much else to say. It's spoiler time, and I will start because I will say that, uh, again, I liked it all very much, and again, it is very fresh in my mind. There were some things in it that I kind of went, okay, wait a second, then what about this and what about that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm wondering, are there plot holes in this film, or am I just sort of missing points, which I could be? Um, but yeah, I, again, just to sort of reiterate, I did feel that the story was pretty spot on. I enjoyed every bit of it. Uh, but yeah, now that we're in the spoiler territory, are there things in this that I am getting wrong? So basically the Krull are good guys. Yes. Well, not necessarily good. The, the scrolls, 
the scrolls, scrolls are complicated. Thank you. Sorry. The, the scrolls are complicated, even in the Marvel comics. Okay, the point, the the general gist of the story of the famous war between the Kree and the scrolls is that they're basically both bad guys, but they're the both the biggest bad guys in the galaxy. Uh, at okay. least that's how it was in the comic. Now here. Here they kind of changed that up a little bit. They made the scrolls more of a refugee style status characters instead. Mm. Um, which, all right, it goes against comic canon, but I didn't really mind it as much. But yes, in the comic books, they were they were actually both villains. You know, there. But in both cases, there were aspects within each group that were were good people, and had that have helped out the Avengers. Or have been helped by the Avengers before. In this particular case, they decided to go with the, the idea of the the Talos character being a good guy, like a pretty pretty straight out good guy. Yes. Yeah, I, I I that's sort of my. I mean, yeah, that's what I walked away with as well, obviously. And yeah, I kind of was like, all right, um, I could have sworn. And again, I this is not a a this is not a comic that I am very familiar with but i i thought that the scrolls were kind of not so good guys no but this 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 film sort of took a different position on it it took a little bit of a different position on it and they can always revisit it because things can change as you go along uh because i originally thought that this was going to lead into the secret invasion so i was a little disappointed in that respect that the scrolls seem to be neutered i guess would be the best way to say Mm. kind of a little bit neutered from the comic book um because I really thought that the next thing was going to be the secret invasion by the scrolls. So the fact that it's not is a little disappointing, but it has been 20 years. We don't know, you know, this is a group of scrolls. How do we know that there's not more to the scroll story than we even have been led to believe? How do we know this just this isn't this just isn't a subset of scrolls? The Kree, mm. you know, for for a small group of of people, an extremely small group of people, the Kree are very adamant about you know, oh, there's an infestation, we gotta wipe them out. Infestation, that's the word they used each time. So who's to say that there isn't actually a whole planet of bad scrolls waiting to be found, and these people are just some refugee from an old, uh, who's my flippy? Mm. So there's still, I think there's still ways that you can portray them as bad guys. I think just for the purposes of this movie, they subverted it a little bit to try to um, add depth and nuance to it, and also to make the eventual fight with the Kree against uh, Carol much more uh, have much a little bit more depth than it would have earlier. I don't know if I'm agreeing with you or disagreeing with you, but I think what they're what they're doing was to try to simplify things as opposed to nuancing it right. um, to try to get a pretty self-contained story in two hours. Right. Especially uh, to with try a character to get into that people the... aren't familiar with. I think that's the other part of it. Yeah. So they did de- definitely try right. to cut down on the over explanation of the two races just to be able to tell Carol's story. Agreed. Yeah, and I, th- I and I, I, there was a line in there where you know somebody's apolog- she, she's apologizing to the to the scrolls, and the guy says, "My hands, it's war. My hands are are as filthy, right, as well." Uh, so I thought that was nice. Um, so yeah, okay, that and that and you're absolutely right. They did sort of they gave us a small group of sc- scrolls and said. These are refugees. They didn't say that the entire race is great and and everything is wonderful. Mm-hmm. So they did leave it. Yeah. Um, but I, on, on the other hand, I do feel that they Jude Law's character. I mean, I think by the end we're pretty much agreeing that this is a bad guy and that's that. Yeah. Um, but again, I I did like that it kept me guessing throughout the whole thing because again that I did not expect when I saw the trailer and I saw lizards coming out of the ocean. I thought, oh, well, the bad guys are here. <laughs> that's it. So I so I, I I enjoy the fact that they played on that a little bit. Yeah, that's properly subverting your audience's expectations because here you've got the good-looking Jude Law on the one hand, and he's wearing yeah. the same uniform as Carol Danvers. So immediately you're like, oh, well, he's just one of the good guys. And then you have these creepy, slimy little creatures that can morph into things. Oh, here's clearly yeah. the bad guys. So I kind of liked that form of subversion. That is a good way of subverting. As opposed to The Last Jedi, which I can't believe I'm saying again. <laughs> okay, so what else? <laughs> um, how'd you like uh, how'd you like Goose? <laughs> well, okay, that's <laughs> well. I I still sort of wonder why they bothered to change his name to Goose because because again they 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 do have 
do you think that maybe Disney was was worried about being a little overly self congratulatory by focusing on the fact that his name is Chewy? Oh, we own the rights to Chewy too, by the way, so we could do what we want. Or do you think they were trying to just sort of update the character for the '90s? I think it was more about reminding the audience that this is this is a, a female pilot from the '80s and '90s, and and honestly, any pilot from the '80s, from the late '80s, early '90s, Agreed. is a Top Gun fan. So. Right. But but here's the interesting part. Technically speaking, Carol didn't name the cat. That was Lawson that named the cat. There you go. And that's kind of what I was sort of trying to get at. First of all, right, where did this cat come from if it's not a cat? If it's a full-blown alien, why why is it named Goose? Why does it seem to know Carol? Like I mean, the implication was that at least I think so, that this was Carol's cat before. In the comics, it was supposed to be Carol's cat. In this right. particular, in this particular one, they made a couple of changes to the origin. And since we're in that area, um, uh, I'll cover it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, Lawson, Lawson being Marvel, is absolutely from the comic. They all they did was change the gender, and I'm okay with that. That's not a big deal. You don't need to. You don't need to even think about that. But there is a much deeper, richer background between Lawson and Carol's character that they didn't get a chance to. Uh, they were actually very close, mm-hmm. uh, and it's been implied, and, and I don't remember correctly, but I think that at one point they actually had a relationship on top of them being uh, co-workers, so obviously they didn't go for that here. The fact that they didn't really cover a lot of the relationship between her and uh, Lawson, I think, was a detriment to the movie, because it would have explained more why she may have decided to name the cat Goose. Or maybe maybe there's a cut scene where uh, Carol names the cat Goose because the cat takes a liking to her after meeting her or something. Who knows? Weirdly, mm. that to me is kind of a loose end. It's 100% absolutely positively that is Lawson's cat or Flecknar. <laughs> I don't remember exactly Fl- what it is. Sorry. Flurgan. <laughs> Flurgan. Yeah, something like that. Um, Mother Flurgan. <laughs> It's definitely supposed to be that, but um, it didn't really get uh, it didn't get across very well. I loved Goose. Don't get me wrong. I thought Goose was a nice little addition, and you know we're in spoilers, so might as well. The fact that Goose is the one that takes Nick Fury's eye. <laughs> yeah, that's a thing we that's can a little talk much about. To me. That was the, a little much to me. You know, <laughs> again, right? Uh, and it was. It, it's an interesting, you know. People sort of, I kind of feel like people are very wary of fan service, quote unquote fan service. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of like, most people get very abrasive to it. I don't mind it so much as long as it's handled right. So I guess there was going to be at least a few nods in here to, you know, future events. You know, how did this happen? How did that happen? Uh, so, okay. So natural. So as soon as the cat scratched the eye and he goes, Oh, don't worry. It's just a scratch. You're kind of already going. And, and I, I like this girl goes, Oh no. Or something or other. <laughs> like, like, that was, I mean, it was funny handled pretty well, but, the, but then again, you're kind of going, so that, and then, and that's how Nick Fury lost his eye and had to wear an eye patch or whatever. Uh, My- okay. My problem with it was until that point, the cat gave no indication of hostility to him. And it just all of a sudden, right. slash. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, is it a poison slash for one thing? And yeah, you're absolutely right. The cat is friendly and cute. And of course you do a flashback to the, to the, I mean, again, if you're uber nerds like us, <laughs> my first thought went to winter soldier. The last time I trusted someone, I lost an eye. Yeah. So he's, which I guess now sort of means the last that he trusted the cat who would have thought, okay, yeah. And it, and it's almost like, again, trying to subvert expectations. If he lost it in the heat of battle in some way, that would have been a little too fine. Okay. I guess that's fair too. Uh, so this was kind of a funny way to do that. I suppose. Yay. You know, but yeah, weirdly it's, it's also fitting in with his character as he grew, you know, because as he grew, he became distrustful of everybody, and his whole uh, raison d'etre was lies and half truths and ways of getting yeah. to the end that he is looking for. So, 
I mean, I'm, I, I will bet you that's how they justified it when they explained it to him because he probably yeah. – because Samuel Jackson is the type of actor that would be like, well, my character said this in Winter Soldier. What do you say about that? So they probably just said, no, no, no. It actually fits because Nick Fury and this and that and so on and so forth. I can see them yeah. explaining it that way. I just don't think it was very effective. And I think, it, if anything, it undercut that line from Winter Soldier now because it made him out to be like a little whiny little brat. I figured something like – a major, like a major turning point of betrayal, that the loss of that eye should have been. This is the implication I got when I was watching Winter Soldier. That it was the loss of that eye that was the yeah. major turning point that made him just come in and just be the Nick Fury that we know today, the non-trusting guy, the you know always looking out for the angle to get to the right to the right ending that he wants. Not just mm. the story about his father and the and the bag or anything like that. And then it turns out to be this. Eh, a little lame, guys. A little lame. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. I mean, it's 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 almost right. It, okay, that's one way to do it. And now it ends with a rim shot instead of something, whatever. I I, I kind of find that a, any time, it's almost like there are moments in film. Luke Skywalker throwing the lightsaber over his shoulder comes to mind. <sighs> where it's this almost wasn't like that I feel. Bad. I'm not saying right. I'm not saying that. We should we should but point I, that I, out. I, you you can feel moments in movies where you where you feel that the writers are saying to themselves, "I can't come up with anything as epic as people are imagining for this moment mm -hmm. to have caused this to happen." So or you know, so the only thing I can do is do it as a joke instead and be like, "Oh look, surprise! I bet you thought it'd be something else." And it's like, well, "Yeah, I did think it'd be something else." Um, so yeah, I. Again, not terrible, but you, like I said, you, you you sort of feel that the writers are kind of going, well, I, I can't match it with epicness, so I got to do something funny. Yeah. And you know what? That's okay. Some jokes will land when it comes to that, yeah. and some didn't. Eh, this, didn't, this one didn't land with me, and obviously it didn't land with you either. I, again, not terrible. And, yeah. and I mean, it, it definitely got a chuckle out of the audience. But, it, you know, again, you, you sort of sit back. It's like, like at, at the, in the moment, you laugh, and then you kind of walk away and go, oh. But that's how Nick Fury lost his eye. <laughs> and we will always, that, that forever now, it will be a cat scratch. Okay. Yeah, um, so, but, but again, I did, by the time you got to the end and he's sitting at his, at his computer and, or, and he's, he's sort of drafting the, you know, whatever he was starting to call it, the defense initiative or something or other. Yeah, something like that. And then he looks at the picture and he sees the word Avenger. Yeah. And I, and he changes it. I, I, and again, they, they do a great, it, it reminded me again of um, the end of Civil War, I guess it was, when the new Avengers are sort of in the room mm -hmm. and Cap starts to go, like, he opens his, and you're waiting, he's going to say Avengers Assemble, he's going to say Avengers Assemble, and they cut right before he says it. Yeah. This reminded me of that. That was Age of Ultron, by the way. By the, it was Age of Ultron. Ult that's right. It was, you're right. Yeah. It was Ultron. Um, so, yeah. And so here, when he types it in, you're waiting for the camera to switch back and show you what he... And but it didn't happen, you know. Yeah. Um, there, there's people out there that actually speculate he actually wrote the Carol Initiative. <laughs> I, I, well, I, I think not that I bought, not that I counted or, or thought about it, but I I'm sure you could count the keys when it comes out again and we watch it again and forget. I'm just exactly. joking, man. Yeah, people yeah. are just silly. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so. I don't know, but I like that. I thought that was I thought that was a neat way to do it. I don't remember if Carol's call sign was Avenger in the original comic. I don't think it would have been, yeah. uh, you know. But it was a neat little callback. Um, well, let's let's talk for a second. Um, let's talk about uh, Brie Larson as Carol Danvers. Yes. Okay. Um, I felt that you know, with the way the story was in the beginning. With her constantly on edge and repressive and everything and just not really showing a lot of emotion. I think they kind of explained that well, but I feel like it almost was a detriment to the character because then by the time she actually does come out of her skin, so to speak, and become herself, you're kind of already used to the the dour, I'm, I'm focused, I'm holding myself together, I'm holding it all in, I'm not reacting or anything like that. I feel like that kind of overpowered her character. And I'm not blaming Brie Larson necessarily for that act because I kind of felt when she was loosening up a little bit, she was better. I just kind of feel like they kind of wrote the character into a, in a corner with this particular method of storytelling, especially mm. with because they wanted to add the memory loss uh, problem as well. Yeah, true. I, I did. I thought she was fine. 
Mm-hmm. I really didn't have much problem with her, and I, I, it's, and I did walk in trying desperately to forget everything that I had heard. You know, all the, all the, all the kind of <clears throat> controversial comments or whatever. Right. Um, and and really kind of go in fresh. And I, I did try to tell him, you know, again, let's focus on this film and let's. I thought she did fine. I, I really didn't have much of an issue with her portrayal. I, I did sort of, but I did say to myself, okay, it's not bad, but why Brie Larson? Why is she the one you chose for this character? Was, was there something specifically about her that, that dazzled you in some way that said, this is going to, this is the new face of, and I remember thinking like, I, I don't, I just kind of don't know why they went down that road because I feel like they're, this was a character, like you said, if she's holding it in, holding it in, holding it in, and then there's some sort of explosion of, of release and, and, and an explosion of character, I, I wasn't necessarily getting that either. And I remember kind of looking back at her career th- thinking to myself, like, well, if I think about what she's done before, I, I find it to be an odd choice. And, and I, you, you like, I, it was almost, it was like I was waiting to find out why. Brie Larson is the character, the the actress to play such an important character. And I wasn't getting it. I wasn't really understanding it. Um, but again, I'll give it a solid not bad. And I felt that she had enough likability. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say charisma, but I but I will say likability that you did sort of get behind the character and you you were happy to sort of be with her through the journey. Um, so I, I really, I didn't find anything wrong with her at, at, at all. Uh, again, just not, not a powerhouse of, of presence either. Mm. Um, but serviceable, I will definitely say serviceable. And, and again, I, the, the, the total film worked for me. So, so then she worked. Yeah. I found that her moments with Nick Fury, uh, and with the Rambos were some of the best moments from her in the entire movie. Um, but other than that, she was good. She wasn't. I didn't. I, I. I don't suppose. I didn't expect her to knock it out of the park or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I just. I kind of was missing. I guess I was kind of missing like the stand tall Carol. Like you know, yeah. They, they didn't really get to that Carol until the end of the movie. In fact, I'm going to go out and say that we didn't see the Carol Danvers that I've been looking for until. The first cutscene. I think her standing there looking at Scarlett Johansson saying, where's Nick Fury, is the most Captain Marvel I saw throughout the entire movie. You know, firm. You know, assured. Confident. I felt that that was the, be- the closest we've gotten to her character as portrayed in the comic. Um, maybe. Yeah. Okay. I, I, <laughs> it was, I know. Where's Nick Fury? It's three, it's three lines. But there was yeah. just something in her demeanor that just showed me much more confidence, much more assuredness. Like, yeah. not not ego, not like I'm all that in a bag of chips. Just leaderly quali- qualities. I felt just from that, mm. just from that uh, saying. You know, she wasn't being forceful. Yeah. She wasn't being demanding. She was just like, like re- it, it, it like reminded me of the first time Cap gave the orders to the Avengers. Only Cap mm-hmm. did it better. No offense, uh, Brie sure. Larson. Cap, but but he had a lot more lines to deal with. But I I felt that that was the first time that I really got to see the Carol Danvers I wanted to see in the movie, and it was just mm. too brief. Yeah, I yeah I, I actually thought that I mean the cutscene was great. It was interesting, and I I I sort of wondered if it was a little too if it telegraphed a little too much of what we can expect from the next one. I kind of thought like mm. this moment might have been better served had it, they saved it for the movie. Um, and I also wondered, like, I remember thinking, like, just the sort of, you know, the way the camera sort of slides to the right, and there she is standing there. I kind of remember thinking, like, I don't know, like, there could have been a much more dramatic introduction. Because, again, this is the first moment where Captain Marvel, Captain Marvel is now with the Avengers. Right. And I remember thinking, like, all right, it was good. I liked it, and I, I like where we're headed, but I kind of just thought the the the... the punch of that moment was sort of missed mm. um i could have been that. done a little more interesting I can see um, that. yeah um but yeah I, you see and you said what you said before about 
her with Nick Fury versus her with the Rambo family. I remember thinking she did seem much more at home with the Rambo family, I thought, than with Nick Fury. Mm-hmm. I thought the scenes, again, the intro, as soon as when when she's on the phone and, and Fury shows up with Coulson um, and she's kind of, you know, snarking through that scene a little bit. And I was kind of like, oh, it was OK. It was it was good. But I did I did feel like once they got to the Rambos, I kind of felt like and rightly so that she did seem more at home with them, more at home, you know, as she's kind of going through thoughts and things and, and, and they're trying to bring her up to speed on things, which, again, story wise, that made a lot of sense. She should feel at home or seem at home in this environment. So, again, the like everything leading up to that, I thought didn't quite work as well. Um, so again, it, I almost feel like I'm sort of contradicting myself as I'm <laughs> saying this, because again, it did make sense for her to seem at home in this environment, but then it sort of stood out with her and Nick Fury, which made me wonder, was that the right course to go? Maybe a stronger actress would have done better with that material. Somebody with a little more presence. Um, you know, it's hard to say. It's hard to, it's hard to and, go and is toe it, to This toe is an origin story. Yeah. Yes, it is. Right. Well, true. right. First of all, who's going to stand toe to toe with Samuel Jackson? You're, right. Yeah. Um, and not seem out of their league a little bit. But again, this is an origin story. This is a build up to story. Mm-hmm. So if, if she walked in and was like, oh, you know, like, like, you know, again, if she, if she did seem strong alongside Samuel Jackson, maybe that would have been wrong. So again, it's not a, it, it's not a criticism. Again, it's more. I'm going through my thoughts again, literally. Like I, mean, like, like I said, it's so fresh that I'm, I'm I'm thinking as I'm speaking, and I'm just sort of you know analyzing and and processing. So again, I don't know. Is it wrong that she sort of seemed not a little mousy? I guess at times, probably not. I mean, it probably was exactly where our character should be. Hmm. Um, and again, it's supposed to reach a climax, you know, where the powers are all there, and it's like kablam. That's how. I mean, you know, I mean, even Mary said as we were watch- as we right outside the theater, you know, she seemed to be struggling as she was fighting, and then thirty seconds later, she was stopping the big gigantic warheads. Yeah, and I was like, well, okay, yeah, and I I got that same thing too. But again, it, we are supposed to be watching her discover the the true potential of her power. So I was like, okay, that that makes sense. Mm. You see, the funny part is, is the scenes with Samuel L. Jackson. I mean, you can't outdo Samuel L. Jackson. It's Samuel L. Frickin' Jackson. But I still felt that... In Samuel the, L. Mother Flogging Jackson. Mother Flogging Jackson, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I still kind of felt that there was a nice camaraderie and chemistry between the two of them. And I felt hmm. like I felt like it would have been nice to have seen more of that. Because by the end of it, when, he, when she gives him the modified pager, I kind of felt like there was a nice little bond between the two of them. And I kind of felt like... Hmm that all the adventures that they had before actually did some zero, some ga- zero, some game, excuse me, did sum up into something, uh, something uh, likable. I, I like that. They didn't really need to go any further than that. And I felt that it was, it made the, the way the character progressed from that beginning up with Nick Fury, I felt makes sense. And I felt like his reaction to her and her reaction to him, you know, she, she could have easily gone off into some like, you know, smugness category. And I feel like those scenes were like the beginning of the humbling of the character because up mm. until this point, it was like, you know, repress who you are and so on and so forth. And here's Nick Fury kind of pulling her, helping her pull herself out of her shell. I'm not, yeah, yeah. And I, I felt that that was nice. And it, but it wasn't really until she was with her friend that truly she was able to completely find herself again. Mm. And it's an interesting word that you use, the humbling, because I did feel like it's like on some level, they're taking a character who is supposed to be coming up, you know, sort of discovering what her potential. On the other hand, she did sort of have that smugness that they were sort of humbling down. Right. So, yeah, it was it, I, it, it was sort of an interesting thing. Like, like, which way am I supposed to be watching this character go up or down? Mm. Um, and I suppose that gave it a nice level of complexity that she was, you know, on, on one hand, she's sort of coming down from what she thinks she's, she's capable of. And as I'll, and also sort of coming up to what she's actually capable, capable of. Right. 
it's 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 a it's actually a relatively com- complex portrayal that in some ways I don't think the filmmakers really were able to get across very well. I mean, you're mm. talking about a woman who basically spent six years being psychologically abused by the Kree. That's pretty. You can cut it any way you like. That's the general gist of it. They they repressed who she was. They they erased her memory. They tried to yeah. use her as a weapon. Right. You know, that's what she had to endure for the past six years. So the initial Carol Danvers that Vares, the the initial Vares that uh, mm. Samuel L. Jackson meets, you know. Who is this guy to her? You know, oh, pff, I've I've dealt with gods. I've dealt with shape changing things. You're just a a tiny little earthling, and she could have easily fallen into the trap of being over smug with that, but she didn't. Mm. It was like it, she she did she didn't fall into that trap, which I appreciated, and I think a part of that is because you have a Samuel L. Jackson who was able to be like, you know, okay. Let's not take it too serious. Let's, you know, mm. remember, you know, in, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to get my eye scratched by a cat and lose it. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and that is true. That is true. That, that I, I do. The, the bond between her and Nick Fury was for sure, I think, the most likable part of the film. Mm. Uh, I mean, that did carry the carry a lot of weight. The I, By the way, I loved the scene where he's in the car with Coulson and then suddenly Coulson calls on the phone. He's like, where is everybody? <laughs> <laughs> that was an awesome surprise. It, it really was. I did not expect that. There were, and there was a couple of those little moments too, where you think like they would, you know, very good surprises. Mm. There were a lot of nice little surprises to this movie. Surprise that you know. Uh, uh, by the way, just so that we understand, one of the things um, I like the I like what they did with the character. I like where they're going with the character. I felt that they were faithful to the comic book, um, as faithful as they could possibly be. They covered, they even managed to cover the amnesia years of Carol, which originally was due to Rogue. That's how Rogue gets her power of flight because she stole Carol Danvers' powers from her temporarily. Right. Okay. okay. So they couldn't do that, obviously. Rogue, of course, being a mutant. So they couldn't do that with this movie here, but I still felt they handled it very well. I don't mind the Mm. Krees being like the quote unquote super, super, super duper bad guys because I never liked the Kree to begin with. I always thought they were a bunch of arrogant, snobby little sons of bitches. So Mm. screw those guys. I don't mind that at all. Yeah. Um, I would really, really would like to see the scrolls become a bigger threat to the galaxy. I refuse to believe that every single scroll is so happy and joyful and so on and so forth, and they're not going to mess with anything, and we can shape change into anybody we want. And you're not telling me that there's not some power mad scroll out there that's not going to come along and just pretend to look like the president of the United States or something like that. Come on. Right, right. Sure. Yeah. Um, so why don't we go forward in time just a little bit and talk about the Monica Rambo character? Mm, I hope she comes about. Their, their I, bond yeah, was I really thought that sweet. was some interesting, huh? Their bond was really sweet between her and the little girl. Agreed, agreed. The little girl was a great character, and I'm I'm curious now about the foreshadowing, possibly. Oh, I'm going to be pretty sure that there will be a sequel. And it will be set on modern day Earth. And I will guarantee you that that little girl is going to become Photon. By the way, that's the name Monica Rambeau took after she took back the mantle of Captain Marvel. Okay, right, right. Okay. I I thought, yeah, I thought that was interesting too. And by the way, I heard a rumor. I It might just be a rumor. Mm-hmm. But I did hear a rumor that there are two cuts of Avengers Endgame floating around. And that, depending on how well, th- how well the re- the reception is, how good the reception is for Captain Marvel, they might go with either cut, uh, where her character is emphasized, or when her character is a little de-emphasized. Uh, so I'm 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 just curious to know if that's true. Um, and also, I'm wondering, like like, not only am I wondering about that. But now that I've sort of seen the, the the seeds planted for for the Monica Rambo character, I'm I'm wondering. So, is it possible that if let's say this version of Captain Marvel does not do at all well, that they might speed things up and literally change the character altogether and introduce the Monica Rambo character as Captain Marvel for sequels? Um, I didn't hear this rumor, and I hope to goodness this mm. rumor isn't true. The one th- good thing about that cutscene at the end is it shows you. That uh, Carol's uh, uh, Captain Marvel isn't an afterthought in Endgame because there's Cap still with his beard, 
And we know that eventually he loses that beard. So she obviously appears early in the movie, or at least early in the entire process of Endgame. Yeah, yeah. So she's probably going to have a bigger part. Although my guess is that her part's going to be searching the galaxy to find uh, Thanos. Yeah. That, that, that's my personal opinion about that. Um, I hope not. I hope the idea that they're hedging their bets about something like that really kind of annoys me a little bit. I understand from a business aspect that it is, but I feel like you should have more confidence. And frankly, I just heard that the movie opened $123 million, uh for this weekend in the U.S. alone. Yeah, I think she's going to be okay, Joe. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I agree. And, and by the way, even, again, it's not a black or white question. Is is the rumor true? And would the cut be, I mean, the separate cuts, I'm not saying that they're vastly different. I, so even if there is truth to the rumor, the reality could be, well, we're just talking about slight differences here and there. Um, so again, don't, it's, I don't know that, you know, take that as, as with a grain of salt for sure. Um, and yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Honestly, I, I, I want to see the Monica Rambeau character come to life. I absolutely right. positively do want to see her character come to life, but take your time guys. Let's not rush into anything, please. Yeah. Uh, Okay, with that, the other big kind of kind of a plot hole, or I could be wrong, um, the Tesseract, which I thought was a nice little twist, by the way, when when they kind of try to figure out what the you know the, well the source is something else and yada yada yada. Mm. Uh, I mean, the, basically, the engine on this ship she's flying would be similar to the technology that Hydra was was um, developing in Captain America, the first Avenger, right? right? Using the Tesseract as the source and using that power. I thought that was interesting. And I, I liked that little surprise. Uh, with that said, I thought the Tesseract was the Tesseract apparently now is sitting on Nick Fury's desk. Um, According to the final cutscene, Yes. Yeah. So, okay. What am I missing? It, we had it in Avengers. They found it. They found it at the end of First Avenger. It right, comes at the in, bottom of the ocean. Right, and it comes back into play in the opening of the Avengers because Nick Fury had it all along. Now, again, like I said, this movie's fresh in my mind, and I'm already going back. Like no time to kind of go back and remember this and research this. So. That's why they were tinkering with it in the beginning of the first Avengers, because Nick Fury had it all along. There's not a real clear timeline on this. Mm -hmm. The last, the last time from the timeline, the Tesseract was in, uh, that place in Sweden, I think it was. And it was taken by, um, it was taken by Red Skull. Then it was on the plane that Cap was in. Yeah. It transported the Red Skull to, uh, Vormir. Mm Mm-hmm. And then fell through the ship and into and into the ice. The next time we see it, it is in the hands of Howard Stark, who's looking for Cap. But he's not interested in it anymore. He's trying to find Cap. Mm. So they find it, and that's where it last lives. The next time we see it in the cinematic universe, in the timeline from that, if we're going from starting from the 1940s till today, the next time it appears now is on that Kree ship that... Marvell was uh, had built, powering the uh, the drive that they were trying to come up with. Okay, so how did she get it? That's a story that's not known just yet. Okay, so right. my 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 personal my idea is since she infiltrated and was working on Earth, it's possible that the Kree found out that the Tesseract was on Earth and sent Marvell to try to do the experiments there on Earth, away from the Kree homeworld in case anything went bad. Because if it destroyed Earth, they wouldn't have cared if it destroyed Earth. So that's what my feeling is. So she came in, she infiltrated, and eventually was able to work her way up to getting her hands on the Tesseract for scientific experiments. That's where I think it is. So as opposed to finding it, grabbing it, and running, she finds it, infiltrates S.H.I.E.L.D., and just says, well, let me tinker with it right here. Right. Okay. Um, Cause, all cause, right. Cause okay. It, it's, a, it's a dangerous artifact. And it could, it, the, her justification on top of 
not wanting the supreme intelligence to really know what she's trying to do, but she could justify it as, we don't know what the power of this thing is. You don't want me to put it, bring it to Hela and experiment with it, and gosh forbid mm. if anything bad goes happen, it could destroy all of Hela. Who cares if we destroy these earthlings? These backwards earthlings. Yeah, I, right. Uh, yeah, I mean, that that part I, I have no problem with. I guess what I was... So it was in the possession of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yes. Yeah, and it was in possession of S.H.I.E.L.D. the whole time. So, I mean, that that does sort of... And it's now the first time Nick Fury has has become aware of it. Well, yeah, because he was... at During this time, he's still a relatively low-level agent. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay. I would buy that. I'll buy it. I, I think, like I said, I'm, I, 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 it's too fresh to, to know are these plot holes or not. Yeah, they but I think could, uh, they could be, but I, because I'm, I'm filling in the blanks myself. There's no like canon that says for sure this is what happened. I'm just doing this on me. Yeah, and again, it, it's interesting because after how many of these films? I mean, seriously, how, how? This is the twenty twenty third, I think twenty second or twenty. Well, no, it's, I think, I think, I think, and I think uh, Infinity War was twenty. And then Ant Man was twenty one, so this is like twenty two. Okay, so I mean, you're right. How many films into this? And now the writers, it's like, how do we even breathe now in this universe and do anything without tinkering with something that happened prior? You know, it. I mean, it, it's 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 getting to be a tougher and tougher order to try to keep all of the, um, quote unquote plot holes under control. You know, as they go forward. is a universal language. I know a renegade soldier when I see one. Never occurred to me that one might come from above. But what shouldn't be a tough decision is assigning a number to this movie. (laughs) Here at Reviews Without Remorse, we give out of 10. I like this movie a lot. It's not perfect. It's, you know, got its problems. But on a whole... It's very likable. The character is very likable. The people and the actions and the stories, and it was a likable, enjoyable romp. I I had just worked a 12-hour shift when I watched this movie, and I was, I stayed awake throughout the entire thing. That's as good a sign as ever that I really enjoyed it, because the last couple of times I tried that, I fell asleep during the movies. I gave this movie an 8. A very high, high 8. Uh... Is it perfect? No, it's not. Did it have a lot to cover? Yes, it did. And I felt it covered it relatively well, but just from the debate back and forth that Joe and I had, you could see that there are some pieces that are missing. And the one thing that the Marvel movies have done very well is even if they've slightly introduced a character, they still gave them a self-contained story with a beginning, middle, and end, and not a little lot, and not a lot to have to really like delve into plot-wise with the outside universe. This movie is really the first one that I've ever felt feel that it ever kind of feels like it's almost overshadowed by the outside plot of the Marvel Universe. Like it has no choice because of its time frame or because how it's kind of trying to be, you know, a before picture, a prequel of sorts. Hard to really say, but it shouldered the weight okay. It didn't shoulder it perfectly. And I could easily have been convinced to make this a nine. But I think a high eight is quite respectable for a movie that, frankly, I wasn't 100% sure which way it was going to go. What about you? My friend, sometimes I I marvel at the fact, pun not intended, just how similar in, in our thought patterns we are. I am also going to give this an eight, and I honestly feel that I could have been persuaded to give it a nine. Mm-hmm. Um, I also agree that this was a terrific film. It was a lot of fun. I liked the, there was a lot of good surprises in it. There were twists and turns, frankly, that I, I did not expect. And yeah, I thought the whole thing was very satisfying. And honestly, just to kind of wink at the controversial part of it or, or the perceived controversy, I honestly felt that I genuinely feel that this film did not pander to anyone. It did not even really do anything differently in terms of, Mary, Mary suing, Mary suing this character, (laughs) which I was, again, that was what I was nervous about. I was very nervous that they were not going to put any obstacles in front of this character for fear of, again, the, the, the wrongheadedness when they do that to female characters nowadays is that they, they're afraid to give them any imperfections 
for fear of alienating a certain base that will say, but, but you made the character do this. And that's look, a good character has flaws. A good character has, has, you know, things that they need to overcome. Right. I think they did that with this film. I mean, it, it, I will simply say that I think that the character could have been done as a male. The script would have worked fine, but it does work better. The fact that it's a female character. Uh, I, I think the chemistry with certain characters, the, the, the what ifs work better because it's a female character. Um, if there was, there was one or two little things that I kind of thought were like kind of shots at male characters that I kind of think did not make any sense. But I think that was very, very minor, um, and very downplayed. Um, and, and, you know, worked just fine. Um, one of them I thought was a little silly and unnecessary and I didn't quite understand it. Um, but again, I thought the whole story was terrific. I think it's, I think this character is a welcome addition to the Marvel cinematic universe. And it got me very excited for, to see what's going to play out in the next Avengers film. So yeah, I think the high eight is very warranted. Yeah, I agree. It's nice when we get along. <laughs> it's much, it's much more fun when we have, you know, controversy, but it's nice when we get along. <laughs> we're we're going to have to come up with some films that we seriously disagree on so we can have some good full-blown <laughs> arguments. <laughs> it has been a while, hasn't it? It, it really has. <laughs> I, I really thought this was going to be it. I really thought this was going to be the one that finally, you know, we're going to get into it. But you know what? <laughs> maybe, maybe, you know, we could probably salvage it because who asked you, Joe? Uh, who asked me? I tell you what, honestly, and again, it's all very fresh, but, you know, I and I didn't have a whole lot of time to really sort through it. But, uh, the, the two things that come to mind and again, pretty minor points, but it is fresh in my mind. So I'll go for it. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, there were two moments in the film that I thought kind of bashed men and I didn't quite understand why there was, there was a theme that again, she, they're, they're trying to make her overcome and, 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 you know, I like I liked the idea. There was a moment toward the end when they said, "Well, you're just an Earthling" or something to that effect. Right. Um, and it was at that moment where they did a cut of flashes of her standing up after falling down. Right. That was terrific. I liked that. Um, in that though, in that theme, they they implied that her father was a rotten, no good sob, and there were two moments. One where they show another pilot saying to her, you know why they call it the cockpit, don't you? And I'm, and I, and I'm like, I all right, I get it, whatever. What? I knew this was going to be it, too. I did. <laughs> the minute the guy said it on well, the screen, I'm like, oh, Joe's going to have a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm predictable. What can I say? But again, <laughs> again, any time they have to knock some other character to, to elevate a character, I think, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, but that wasn't even the worst offender. The worst offender was the guy who pulls up on the motorcycle and it, and like says something like, like, Hey, toots, you know, give me a smile or whatever. And I, I kind of thought what was funny. What was funny about that was that I had a flashback of that stupid Gillette ad, <laughs> the man bashing Gillette ad yeah. where there's somebody in that video that says, Hey, Hey, sweetheart, let let me see you smile or something, and I kind of, and when I saw that I was like, is that a thing that guys say? I've never in my life heard a guy. I mean, unless you're you're specifically talking about like a father talking to his daughter or someone talking to a family member saying, "Come on, smile, cheer up," something to that effect. To try, I, I I literally said like, is that a thing that I don't know about? Like guys telling women to smile, and then when I saw it here, I went. Hey, there's that thing again. Like maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe I don't, maybe that's a thing that I don't know about, but again, it just seemed like, again, oddly out of place. And I didn't know what it contributed. Um, except for the fact that maybe you, you're not supposed to feel bad when she steals the motorcycle. <laughs> that's the only thing I could come up with for that. Cause I kind of thought otherwise it, it made zero sense. So I, was, I, all right. I didn't get that. So again, that, they those are the little moments that sort of stuck out at me and kind of said, okay, was that necessary? Did did that propel this character? Yeah, not so much. Not not in my opinion. But that but other, but again, that's a pretty minor thing, all things considered. To respond to that for just briefly, uh, number one, I actually have heard and seen guys try to pick up women with like, yo, smile. 
it's eh. it's it's a dated thing, which is actually part of the reason why I'm going to slightly refute uh, this. I it's your opinion. You're absolutely entitled to it. The movie is supposed to take place in 1989. In 1989, the the scene where the guy says it's called the cockpit for a reason. In 1989, women in the Air Force could be trained, but weren't allowed to actually get into fighter planes. They were supposed mm-hmm. to be handling cargo and stuff like that. It was still a new thing during that time frame for f- women to be pilots. So I didn't mind the cockpit line as mu- uh, that much at all because it felt very appropriate for the time frame. The smile thing might have been pushing it a little bit, but I have heard guys try that <laughs> as a pickup line before, so it wasn't too out of place to me. And again, it was supposed to be the 90s. It's, 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 you say to yourself, oh, it's only like 20 years ago. It's like, dude... A lot has changed in twenty years, so it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me. And yes, it was probably used for that type of justification. So I can completely understand where you're coming from for that one. But the co- <laughs> the cockpit one that one didn't bother me because that's that seemed very typical of the of the of a lot of the refrain from that time frame. It it, it was not complete. It wasn't exactly totally unbelievable or anything either. I, so fair enough. Yeah. yeah. For me, honestly, Goose taking Nick Fury's eye. Why? <laughs> I was wondering, yeah, God. <laughs> I I really really I I was kind of hoping that they were teasing like something like that was going to happen and it was just going to be like like a MacGuffin or something like that 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 wasn't actually what it is that maybe that maybe um he got shot and the cat's scratch was what kept kept him alive or something like that, you know, and but he lost his eye in the process or I don't know. I would have taken anything other than this sweet little cat that he basically babied throughout the entire movie and the cat was kind of like, hey, you know what? I kind of like this. Fuck you. <laughs> yeah, and it kind of made you, like seriously, like if the cat just for no reason scratched his eye slightly and now his he's, he's, he's total eye is going to be gone, he has to wear an eye patch or I'd be wary about keeping the cat around. Yeah, exactly. Even, even if I didn't hold a grudge, even if I said, well, the cat doesn't know what he's doing, maybe I won't keep the cat in my office <laughs> for you know on a daily basis. To throw up a Who tesseract knows what he's going to scratch that. next. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I would, you know, honestly, I would have accepted him, keep, him keeping the cat around if he was waiting for the tesseract to come back. That would have made sense to me. Yeah, or you know what they, sh- or like you said, lose it another way. Maybe the cat saved. It. You know, did what he could to repair, but didn't quite fix it totally. That that would have been much. Then better he would have more reason I, to I, keep I, the cat I, around. Exactly. Yeah. But now it's time for four year consideration, and if it's all right with you, my man, I think I'll take this one first. Please do. Okay, for me, there was a lot to like about this movie. I felt the visual effects were pretty good. Um, there were a handful of moments where, um, when Carol was flying around, that I thought were a little bit dicey. I thought the performances were all good. I thought the screenplay was pretty solid, not perfectly solid. And I normally try not to highlight something like a special effect or something like that. But after the Oscar debacle where uh, freaking Infinity War lost to First Man, I'm going to give a shout out to the brilliant special effect geniuses that took 20 years off the life of Clark Craig and Samuel L. Jackson. Because to date, and this is probably the most it's been used in any movie. Normally it's just been like little glimpses here and there, you know, in small spots. This is the best that I have ever seen it. And for the longest that I've ever seen it. And I'm giving the movie complete props for that because it was beautiful. It was nearly seamless. I really, and I've seen Sam Jackson. Sam Jackson, you know, he's He's up there. The man is going to be 70. Do you realize the man is going to be 70? Uh, yeah. I mean, he, he is something else. That's for damn sure. So, uh, yeah. And I'm with you 100% there because, I, I, like you said, I they've done it in other films for, for small portions of the film. You know, I mean, the shots of Michael Douglas mm-hmm. and Kurt Russell were damn good. And Michelle but Pfeiffer. Yeah, they were, yeah, and Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah, but pretty small parts. This was the whole movie. Yeah. And and I, I really didn't blink at all. Yeah. Excellent. Seriously, excellent, excellent work uh, to the special effects, guys. I salute you. How about you, sir? Uh, this is going to be a weird one, but honestly, and I almost feel like I, I, like a lot of people might kind of roll their eyes and, and think a, just the opposite of what I'm about to say. But I thought it was pretty cool 
that they brought in the Tesseract as the MacGuffin here. And again, I, I feel like a lot of people might be going like, but dude, every single solitary bad thing that happens in these movies is because of the Infinity Stones in some way or another. And now they're <laughs> going back to the Tesseract again. Yeah, that's true. But again, I like how they fit it into the timeline of, of the whole universe at this point. And again, it, and it, it, it genuinely took us to talk about it for me to kind of sort of get that, you know, get my head around that and to see, well, did it work? And I'm kind of convinced that it did. So I think that was a nice little twist. The way, again, to include the bigger Marvel Universe into this self-contained story. So I I kind of thought that was a nice little little wink and a nice little a treat, for lack of a way to, better way to say it. Um, and again, I kind of feel like that's, that's my, for your consideration, because I, I think it's getting increasingly difficult to work stories that will fit into the Marvel timeline without, again, causing problems somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that's just pretty damn impressive. Um, and I kind of feel like that's, I wanted to say that instead of saying how they didn't screw up or they didn't give us something, <laughs> a, a, a girl power story that could have, again, could have easily gone off the, ra the rails. And I feel like, you know, again, this is something I would love to take my nieces to. And I uh, hope you do. You know, I, yeah, I, I will. I, I would definitely like it. Uh, I think they would enjoy it, and I do think it sends positive messages, for the most part. <laughs> and thus ends our review of Captain Marvel, ladies and gentlemen. We hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. <laughs> I enjoyed it very much. So I hope, yeah. I and and I I actually am excited now to watch a lot of the reviews that I did not watch, and I'm curious to see what everyone else is saying about it. You know what? We forgot something. We we I can't believe we made it through the entire discussion without talking about. The the opening the the the, the oh uh, Marvel God. uh the Marvel flip credits that, that they did for Stan oh my God was that awesome or what I that was so cool I dude I'm telling you the truth maybe I was tired maybe I've just become an old emotional son of a bitch but I I got weepy yeah I I, I got weepy watching it I I don't blame you and I I honestly wondered just like you know. I knew there would be something. I knew there would be some tribute to him somehow. I knew, of course, that, you know, the, the next film in line would obviously be dedicated to him. And I remember wondering, like, how can they possibly give this man the the credit? How do they give him his due in, in a way that is significant in a film? And boy, did they come up with a way. And I thought that was perfect. Yeah, very, very nicely done. All of his cameos, just so beautiful. With that thunderous, you know, dun, 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 you know. Oh my God, it was great. Really, really good. I remember thinking, I mean, they even like, like right when you expected to see the Hulk, they gave him like the, the green sweater. And I, I mean, like they was, <laughs> the nods were so great. It was like, I mean, they, they seemed to sort of sync up his appearances in a certain way that made a very logical sense, I think. I, I agree. I, I, I could watch that over and over, frankly, of, of the entire movie. It was just really that good. Yeah. And his cameo, hey, Kevin Smith, how does it feel to be in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? <laughs> right? Oh, my God. That was funny. And I totally, it was perfect, too. Because, again, you know, he's back in the 90s. So this is, like, exactly right around that time frame that what he would have been. I mean, and I love, they heard, you know, what was he? There was a, He kept saying his line over and over. Uh, yeah. True Believer something or something. True Believer, yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Uh, it was great. It's, it's so good. Oh, uh, from what I understand, he's only got two more cameos. Mm. Yeah, this is true. Uh, sad, sad, but again, of of very fitting tribute. So I was very pleased with that. Agreed, one hundred percent. Of of all the things with the movie, this definitely was a highlight. Mm. And speaking of highlights, oh boy, we're going down an interesting rabbit hole starting next week. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, we're starting a new film series. This one is. The Abrams era, or as it's been called, um, the Kelvin era of Star Trek, starting with the first one, Star Trek. Reviews without remorse, going where no man has gone before. Oh, you went there. I oh, went there. The easy joke. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> the low hanging fruit I couldn't resist. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. But yes, we'll be doing those three for the next couple of weeks. 
And then probably, I think Shazam is after that, isn't it? Shazam is after that, yes. We were, as soon as we're done with Star Trek, Shazam will be our other Captain Marvel movie this year. Kind of excited <laughs> about that. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm very much looking forward to that. Frankly, I, I feel uh, like that that one. I, I feel like going into this film, I felt pretty comfortable that I was, you know, I I knew reasonably what to expect. That one, no clue. I I genuinely do not know. I I might hate it. I might love it. I so so it'll be interesting to see what we walk out of that with. Easily could go either way. Yeah. And as for the Star Trek series, I predict a lot of up and down emotions as we're watching. It. I will agree with that. That's for sure, and, I, and I'll be nice. This will be nice series to revisit because I haven't uh, like sat down uh, and watched a lot of them recently. So yeah, looking forward to it. Yep. But after Shazam, then we're gonna do the Hulk series, and then Avengers Endgame on um, April 29th. It is coming up fast. Oh my goodness, the time it's it's all coming fast. It's I tell you, the the, the first part of this year is gonna be pretty stellar. Indeed, indeed. So until next time, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. Joe, excellent show, my man. I'm with you, my brother. Good show as always, and uh, I will see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Reviews Without Remorse podcast with Joe and Dave. Join us here every Thursday for a new episode, and be sure to check out the Reviews Without Remorse channel on YouTube for spoiler-free reviews of new releases. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider becoming a patron. You can find our page on patreon.com slash reviews without remorse, one word. As little as $1 a month goes a long way. All clips in this podcast are for commentary and critique and is considered fair use. No copyright infringement is intended. Calling all Jan Michael Vincents! Calling all Jan Michael Vincents! In a world where there's eight Jan Michael Vincents. We need one Jan Michael Vincent to Quadrant C! We need two Jan Michael Vincents to Quadrant E! And 16 Quadrants. There's only enough time for a Jan Michael Vincent to make it to a Quadrant. He can't be at two Quadrants at once. Hey, Rick, who who is Jan Michael Vincent? Oh, man, I'm trying to remember, Morty. Jan Michael Vincents are used up. No. I need a goddamn Jan Michael Vincent! Is it important that we know who Jan Michael Vincent was in order to get this? Nope. I, I refuse to sign the legislation that allows more than eight Jan Michael Vincents to his precinct. This January, it's time to Michael down your Vincents. Jan Quadrant Vincent 16. Whoa! Whoa! That's Jan Michaels. Excuse me, nurse. Can you take my temperature? Because I think I have Jan Quadrant Vincent fever over here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Morty, you done it.